Today we have the poem Strange Meeting by Wilfred Owen. It's taken from the collection of ISC poems, Rhapsody. Here we had an earlier poem about another strange meeting, that is Abhisara, in which we saw two people from two different planes, a woman who represented the material world and a man who was an ascetic. And we saw a meeting between these two worlds. And from that meeting, we saw the, that so much of compassion and love came from that meeting. So today we have another poem from the same collection, which is also about a strange meeting. So why is it strange? Let us examine. It seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound dull tunnel long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. So here we see that the beginning of the poem it is said in the voice of a soldier. It is a soldier who is speaking to us. This soldier is in the middle of a battle. He is fighting and Right in the middle, it seemed, the very word seemed shows us that it could be a feeling, it is like a dream, it can be a figment of imagination. It seemed that out of that battle he escaped. He did not really escape, but he feels that for a moment he has escaped. And he has gone down a long tunnel. Long since scooped, this tunnel seems to have been made ages ago. It is scooped through granites where titanic wars have, you know, caused the tunnel to be formed. So titanic wars refers to the ancient ages. Again, we are going into Greek mythology, the titans. We know there is Hercules, Atlas, Epimetheus. These are the very most well-known titans and there has been long ago a war between the Olympian gods and the titans and this has caused this granite, this tunnel to be scooped in and such a tunnel, so you can hear the poet by the very word titanic shows us how great, how immense is this place. Titanic wars had groined. The very word groined is an architectural term to show the intersection between two walls. It also has a meaning of groins or the physical body below the abdomen. So there is a lot of intensity, the underbelly of something. This is what we are made to think of. Yet also there, encumbered sleepers groaned too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. So here in this tunnel, when he reached down, there were a lot of people sleeping or were they in intense thought? They could not be stirred awake. They could not be woken up. And so our author and the soldier thinks that, are they dead or are they dreaming? Then as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition and fixed eyes. So here the soldier, he probes those people who seem to be lying as if they are dead. He probes them and one gets up. One gets up and looks at the soldier with piteous recognition. Those eyes are filled with pity, sadness. Now the word probed. This word also brings to mind war. Quite often in a war, battleground, so many soldiers fall. And sometimes the enemy is there checking. Maybe with the butt of his rifle, he's checking out. Are these people dead? And sometimes the enemy may do harm, may insult the body that is lying there. And on the other side, we know that in a battlefield, those friends of those who are slain, they too will come and probe at those bodies, hoping that there is life remaining, hoping that they can take their friends and rush towards help, towards water, towards medical aid and maybe sustain them. 
and then there is the brave warrior who takes back those bodies so that he may honor them in the name of his country he may honor them and give them a decent burial and that probing is coming to our mind here so when a soldier probed one of those bodies that body got up with piteous recognition in fixed eyes lifting distressful hands as if to bless and by his smile i knew that sullen hall by his dead smile i knew we stood in hell and when he saw this person getting up and the the very word distressful not distressed but distressful hands are raised up as if to bless so there is an oxymoron here the person does not look like a very alive good human being coming in a very good state of mind coming to bless no it seems a uh, a visage as somebody who is in pain and in torture but that person's arms are raised to bless and by that fixed smile on that face our author or the soldier knew that he was in hell he is standing in that tunnel that led to hell so now we are reminded of pictures of zombies that we see in movies they have a fixed glaring smile a fixed eye you know there is life but it is not real life it is like death in life right so such an image is coming with a thousand fears that vision's face was grained yet no blood reached there from the upper ground so this vision seemed to have a face that was filled with fear so much of fear so much of uh, anxiety is there yet there is no blood in that tunnel there is you know there is nothing it is not the battle ground it is a far away place and no guns thumped or down the flues made moan there was no moaning there was no groaning there was no battle sounds there was no sound of a cannon firing or bullets whizzing by nothing was there it seemed calm cold detached and yet the soldier is afraid why so here we need to ask that question why is it all so strange strange friend i said here is no cause to mourn none said the other save the undone years so the soldier is telling this new friend this strange friend he said there is no cause to mourn you don't have to cry don't be scared there is nothing there is no battle raging here why are you scared but this strange friend replies none i too know there are no bullets there is no blood shed but i fear the undone years so this is a very significant word the undone years the years that could have been the years the soldier could have lived the hopelessness whatever hope is yours was my life also so i had an early death i have come to hell too early what about all those undone years where i would have lived and you too you too have are going to have so many regrets in your life you too are going to have those undone years whatever hope is yours was one's mind too i went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair but mocks the steady running of the hour so then this soldier says that there was a time when i pursued beauty when i wished to see beauty in my life and not the beauty that lies in braided hair or beautiful eyes so here we realize that he is not talking about a woman he is not talking about the love of his life but that love which is wild which is powerful which belongs to the whole universe which lies not calm in eyes or in braided hair it is not materialistic but mocks the steady running of the hour the the time that is lost to human beings 
and if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. So this beauty is the very same beauty that Keats has sung about. Truth is beauty, beauty truth, and that is all he need to know in his Grecian urn. So this truth, the ultimate truth, the universal truth, that is what the poet is talking about here. For by my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something had been left, which must die now, I mean the truth untold. So this is about truth. We feel that the poet regrets that this soldier regrets that had he lived, his mirth, his laughter, his love would have gladdened the hearts of many men around him. And his sadness, his weeping, he would have come out of this war and told us the atrocities of war. How dehumanizing war is. How immoral war is. How futile war is. And if he could convey all these truths to the world around him, don't you think that maybe he could have stopped war? Maybe he could have put an end to it. But all those truths must die now. It must die with me for I have died in battle. I have not been able to come out and tell the people the atrocities of war. I mean the truth untold. So here we see. Here we are reminded of all the romantic poets. Keats, who has oft and oft told about the love for truth and that that truth is the only beauty in this world. The very word strange meeting brings to mind Shelley's Revolt of Islam, which is one of the inspirations for Wilfred Owen. Let us continue. The pity of war, the pity of war distilled. Now men will go content with what we spilled. Or discontent, boil bloody and be spilled. So, now the pity of war. This soldier has not been able to come out of war. He has not been able to tell people what is the true meaning of war. So, what is going to happen? The people who are going to come in the future, they might either be happy, they may be content with what war has done. They will go content with all the blood that we have spilled. Or there will be some people who are discontent. And those people will hold up this banner of war. Those people will not know that these soldiers who fought did not wish this war to continue. Not knowing that new people will come forth and they will continue this raging meaningless war. They will be swift with the swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. So these people, we here we see there is a paradox. You know, any war, it is said, is an act of bravery. These soldiers, they are uh, praised by their country, honored by their fellow men, as people who have laid down their life for their country, for the righteous cause. For victory, they have marched forward. But is this really bravery or is this futility? These are the things that we need to think about when we listen to this poem. None will break ranks. What is breaking ranks? You see that in a military or, you know, if you see a group of soldiers marching left, right, left, right, they, they march in an order, in a discipline. They march according to the rules of the army according to the rules of their commander. But who among them will break those rules? Who will say, no, I'm not marching towards those people. I am not going to fight because they are not my enemies. They are fellow men whom I do not even know, whose interests are the same as mine, whose hobbies are the same as mine, whose life is the same as mine, whose love for life and search for truth is all the same as mine. I refuse to fight. Wouldn't that be bravery? Refusing to fight. Refusing to stand or walk according to the ranks. 
so here he says no people will go forward with the swiftness of the tigress like a tigress protecting her cubs which is the fiercest image that you can conjure in your mind with such fierceness these young soldiers will go to protect their country none will break ranks though nations trek from progress again a very important word from progress nations are not trekking towards progress any country where there is the use of arms where guns are used by people where weapons are wielded by civilians they must be the most uncultured and the most furthest away from progress and again countries who who are indulging in warfare they too are not on the path of progress they are all trekking away from progress courage was mine and i had mystery wisdom was mine and i had mastery these two lines are very important first of all for the beauty of these lines courage was mine and i had mystery wisdom was mine and i had mastery secondly for the thought in them these lines as an individual the soldier says i was courageous i was very courageous i went to the forefront of battle and i had mystery there was a sense of adventure in me a quest for truth in me i had that mystery of life in me courage was mine and i had mystery wisdom was mine i had intelligence and i had mastery i had the mastery the skill to fight to live but now all that is gone to dust all that has been shot to hell according to the poet so here the most important word that i feel is futility how futile is war all those deaths for nothing all those deaths meaninglessly given up to miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled i had the wisdom to not march along with this world into a retreating this world this country this government was taking us where into vanity into vain cities which are not walled which are not even protected i had the sense inside me i had the intelligence to say no i as a person knew that what we were doing was not worthwhile then when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels i would go up and wash them from sweet wells so he is now talking about the future those men who would come instead and they would continue this war and so much blood would be filled in the battlefield that their chariots would get clogged in this mush of human bodies and blood and despair that the chariot would not be able to move forward then when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels i would go up and wash them from sweet wells i would go and wash them from wells what are these wells even with truth that lie too deep for taint i would wash them with truth the ultimate truth that is too pure i would have poured my spirit without stint but not through wounds not in the cess of war for heads of men have bled where no wounds were so here he says that he is ready to go and wash those chariots with truth and tell those people not to fight any more but all this is lost because he has died in battle he cannot come back to this earth and tell the truths now the words i would have poured my spirit without stint this is a biblical line christ pours his spirit without stint he with utter mercy he would pour his spirit out here we see that the very image of christ is also brought to mind with the dead soldier that i would give up the very christian ideology that christ would give up his life for the sins of others there is a wishful thinking that with these deaths pray let this war stop 
the soldier does not want any more deaths he does not want any more young men to go into war and lose their lives so he says not through the wounds not on the cess of war but through uh, telling the truth to the world so foreheads of men have bled where no wounds were so again there is an illusion of illusion to christ with the uh, thorns the crown of thorns on his forehead bleeding for mankind and at the same time we are also i think that poets come into play here the people who are wounded in their hearts they do not have wounds on their body but they are wounded they are writing so much foreheads of men have bled where there were no wounds so many people who have not partaken in the wars imagine the families of the fallen soldiers do they not carry their wounds unto their death mothers wives children children who are orphaned women who are widowed mothers who have lost their sons they all carry the wounds without actually spilling the blood but they carry the wounds unto their last moment and what have they gained what have they gained just because two governments have decided that a war must continue young boys young enough young as 20 and 19 mere children have given up their lives for the cause that they do not even know what it is they do not even know why their governments have decided to fight the last paragraph is very important i am the enemy you killed my friend i think this line is very significant because of the paradox the oxymoron contained in it because it has two words which are not usually used together friend and enemy you are i i am the enemy you killed my friend so now we are coming to the point about who this soldier is this soldier is telling our author that you killed me yesterday in battle and i am that man who you killed i am that enemy you killed my friend this very line shows us that had these two young men met in any other walk of life had this german and this english man met in any other walk of life they would have been friends their interests their common passion for life their very age would have dictated that they would have become friends but since they met in battlefield one must kill the other i knew you in the dark for so you frowned and in hell this soldier whom who was killed is telling the other one i saw the very same frown on your face yesterday in battlefield and that is why i recognize you i know it's you you frowned in this very same manner when you killed me yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed yesterday you saw me and you took your dagger and you stabbed me and you killed me i parried i tried i ducked i tried to evade your blow i tried to shove you off but my hands were loath and cold because it was too late his hands turned cold he was dead by the time he was maybe he raised his hand to ward off the bullet the dagger he was killed let us sleep now and now he tells the enemy let us sleep now you and i you two have come to this hell let us sleep now there is nothing we can do those undone years they will go on so here there is a lot of depth in this poem Wilfred Owen was an English poet a soldier who fought in the first world war this poem was published right after the first world war and it is in the last few days of the first world war when the victory was announced that a stray bullet killed Wilfred Owen and his life a gentle life ended at a very young age of 25 and in that very young age he saw a lot of his fellow soldiers young men killed in action and we see that uh, the there was a stage 
where Owen started doubting the truth of war. He was a very brave soldier. He was known for his bravery. And in a, uh, you know, at that period, there is something called war poetry, which we have to be familiar. Before we learn the poetry of uh, Wilfred Owen or Siegfried Sassoon, all these war poets, war was at that period shown as something romantic, something chivalrous, something that every young man must do in order to save his country, his government. But then there came a movement in war poetry where people started telling the truth about war. So, Sazun, there is no Owen without Sazun, we can say. So, Siegfried Sazun was one of the poets who, he was known as a daredevil, somebody who took on so many German soldiers single-handedly. That is his description because he felt that even though war was futile, if there was no other way to end it, he said, I know this is wrong, but I would rather die with my friends. He was such a character and at a certain point, he started publicly protesting, protesting against young men being sent into war. So at that time, he was sent to Cry Lockhart War Hospital. His commander insisted that he had shell shock because it was not good for the army that somebody as important as him was telling that you are all being fooled. There is nothing romantic or chivalrous about continuing war, about simply hating Germans. We know that the war is simply between the governments. But for a very long time, after the First World War, every British man felt that it was his patriotic duty to hate Germans. So when Sazun was in the hospital, Owen too was there, wounded. And they had a beautiful friendship. And from that came this poem, Strange Meeting, which was read by Sazun, which was encouraged by Sazun. And Owen, maybe this became his ticket to immortality, we can say. Because this poem is one of the most important war poems. Because it is very complex, very deep. Now, this strange meeting, we can also take it as a meeting between Owen the soldier and Owen the poet. It could also be that. Owen the soldier is there, out there, killing people, fighting, and there is Owen the poet, who wishes to tell the whole world the truth, that war is futile. In his anthem for doomed youth, he says that only the pallor of young girls is the true wake at your funeral. Only those handful of people who will cry for you, they are the only people who lose. The government does not lose. And Sazun, in one of his poems, he even shows how, uh, you know, how unheroic war is. There is one of his poems called The Hero, in which he describes how a commander is coming to an old lady, a woman in white hair, he says, the only one who cared about her son, the commander is going and telling this old lady that your son was a hero. He was blown to bits in the German trench. And as this general walks out of that house, we see the lines. What hero was he, that swine, who kept begging to go back home? And I had to order him to be in the battlefield until he was blown to bits. So that was the truth. So this is what is shown here. These people are shown as men first, not as soldiers. They are not robots. They are not machines that have to be sacrificed. They are human beings. There is an instance of the world war in which it is said that during a Christmas time, the German soldiers were heard singing their carols in the German language. And the British soldiers, those young men too, started singing their carols. And slowly these men, they came out of their trenches. And it is said that they had a happy game of football, just as young boys should do. And they made merry, they exchanged cigars. And the very next morning, they were called back, back to the ranks, which he says, 
the ranks which nobody has the courage to cut off or go away from and they had to fight so this poem shows us that every human being has the same truth they have the same instinct the same desires and how unheroic is war by showing us the futility of it owen wishes to take away that romantic glorified image of war and during the first world war there was a period where even when the war stopped when the governments could actually put an end to it they continued the peace talks were delayed and uh, owen met his death in uh, 1919 at the end of war thank you